Hey, hi, and welcome to the Lifestyle Show with me, Pam Joseph. You're all very welcome indeed into my humble abode, keeping up with government advice and staying distanced apart. Uh, so we are here virtually, and it's, it's great actually. So you're all very welcome to my humble abode, and lovely to see you again. I have to keep saying thanks, you out there, you just keep giving us all this great um, uh, messages, kind messages and support. Um, you know, the way you're seeing us and what we're doing and, and what we're aiming to do as well, giving people a platform that maybe you may not get anywhere else. So once again, thank you for all of that. Um, now for the next couple of hours or so, please keep tuned in to us as we edutain you, uh, both myself and my guests as well. You're also very welcome to interact to, with us on the show and, and any comments or questions you'd like to pose, that's great. Huge response to our Black Lives Matters debate last week. Wow. Um, we'd like to thank you again for that. But we continue looking into the race relations in the UK. Uh, and as ever, we have a panel of movers and shakers uh, who will be discussing the issue in the UK, um, in depth in the UK. And you can uh, hopefully get involved in this now. There's various ways you can do that. You can um, message us via YouTube, MediaNet Live TV email us lifestyle on ben that's all one word lifestyle on ben at hotmelt.co.uk or facebook page lifestyle on ben tweet us at lifestyle tv show like to get your comments like to get your questions do that we had a huge response last week like to get that in again or any comments you'd like to make to us very welcome indeed okay now before i bring in my co-conspirator anthony jordan um i'd like to make this appeal for witnesses uh, to a, a horrific a murder of two sisters in in northwest london uh at uh, the weekend in fact june the 6th so um basically uh, 46 year old biba henry and her half sister uh, nicole smallman 27 were found dead in friant country park in kingsbury on Sunday the 7th of June, they were found on Sunday the 7th of June. Basically what had happened is that both sisters attended um, a, a, a birthday gathering for Bieber celebrating her 46th uh, a birthday. Now they had a, a group of people with them uh, up to about 10 in a very, you know, sort of like common spot is a lovely spot where you can look over and see, you know, parts of London as well as a very, uh, picturesque spot that they were at. So there's many people that go there and many people were there. Um, so this was on Friday, um, uh, the, the, the 5th. What ended up happening um, was that on uh, the Saturday, just before midnight, just after midnight, guests had left them. And so Bieber and uh, uh, um, Nicole were, if you will, sort of tending to things perhaps, but they left them there back behind there. Because they didn't hear from them, friends and family relatives and family um, and friends didn't hear from them the following day, they were starting to call around. They, you know, uh, you know, sort of announced this to the police and told the police that these two ladies were not at home, are not answering their mobile phones. But I've got to tell you that it wasn't until Sunday that their bodies were found and it wasn't by the police. It was by a passerby who, who thought they were sleeping, if you will, on the grass and, and tried to wake them unresponsive and so realized the, these are two dead bodies we need to get people on this anyone who was around the friar park is this kingsbury everyone keeps calling it wembley it's not it's kingsbury yeah no first night um anyone who was around the area between the friday the fifth and also the sunday so straight through friday saturday and sunday were you around there did you see them did you see any confrontations the police have said cod Cause of death, multiple stab wounds. They've stabbed to death multiple times, yeah. Um, they have found the weapon. They had bl blood that did not belong to the sisters. Uh, so it's a third party, if you will. And so they're saying that it's a, it's just one uh, perpetrator and they, he does, they don't believe that the perpetrator is known to the, the, the uh, uh, victims. Oh, so I'm doing this to get everybody on this. If you were around um, the park around, you know, the 5th of June to the 7th of June, certainly in the evening of the 5th of June, did you see anyone that looked a bit shady, looked a bit dodgy? Did you see a confrontation even uh, be between these two these two ladies and, and uh, any individuals? You know, please come through and uh, let, let the police know about that. What we do know is that um, uh, they the belongings, 
certain belongings to the ladies were sprung about the place and uh, even a, a you know a park picker you know bless him um he he took these things thinking that they were just left behind and they they're vital evidence to the police or the police had actually been into tips looking for these things that was thrown away so it, it, this person was able to throw about their their belongings and their bits uh, it seemed like he you know the, the whoever it was had, had rather enough time there is a fear because you can call this now a serial killer so there is a fear you know that this person is still walking around and the police want to emphasize one thing if somebody came home to your home or a friend that you know that was cut wounded arm hand whatever bandaged yeah saturday morning saturday morning or you notice this on saturday yeah please c come forward let us know this we we need to we need to catch this killer because he's you know, there's someone roaming about. If it's not one, it's more, but certainly one person did the deed. Now, you can call the uh, incident room 0208 721 4205. 0208 721 4205. If you don't want your details out there anonymously, Crime Stoppers 0800 555 311. 0800 555 311. These are young women and they, they, they were cut short of their lives and we don't know what the cause is. We don't know anything about it and we need to find out. Yeah. So please, if you know any information, please call those two numbers. Great. OK. Um, OK. At this point, uh, Anthony. That was that was that was a serious bit. Had to had to go over with those. OK. Anthony can join me for now. My um, co-conspirator, a.k.a. The Dark Persuader. Hey, hey, hey. hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I, you know, I'm so touched and hurt by such news that it's kind of, you know, I want to bring the energy and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, wow. And mm. please, anyone, if you do have any, any information on that, um, let's see justice prevail, really, is the most I can say. You know, let's, let's help and get, you know, there is a family, well, families, essentially, I don't know, you know, how big it goes but people are grieving at the moment over this so okay, all support all support will be Anthony you can you you know we hear about murders and single murders if you will but sisters yeah families wiped out with two members this is it this is it this is not making sense um, at all. I'm just at this moment really and truly just hoping that if there is anything that anyone knows in the platform that we have and we can assist in any way you know, let's do it. What 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 is wrong is wrong. Let's do what's right, people. Let's correct it where we can, and yeah. let's hopefully see justice served as soon as possible on okay. this matter. Okay, uh, yeah. from one kind of serious thing to another. To be honest with you, it's happened already. But you know, we're celebrating the third year. Virtual um, memorial service had taken place at 11, 11 a.m. this morning. Grenville third year anniversary. Um, now you can still perhaps. Um, watch this on the on the uh, channels YouTube Humanity for Grenfell third anniversary Facebook Humanity for Grenfell. Um, wow, three years, three years has passed. Anthony, it, I can't even believe the time. To be honest with you, honestly, I remember just seeing it, and I was like, "Are we here already?" I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, and you know, with all the madness that is going on in what they call twenty twenty. It's really hard to believe that. that I, I still remember being just around the corner from that the next day, you know, um, not even being aware because we weren't listening to the radio station, my friend and I, and someone said, oh, are you sure you'd be able to deliver? Because we were doing a delivery at the time to somewhere lo local. And we were like, what's happened? By the time we tuned in and, you know, we still got close and it was just heartbreaking and such tragedy. And once again, just have to put condolences out to the families who had lost people whose lives were cut short due to such a horrific yeah. accident. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm we, we got we got a bag we got a bag of a show but we got really? competition as well that's going to be late i've got to quickly say this target it is yes 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 <laughs> on board with the lifestyle show so guys if, you, if you're a fan of some nice herbal teas this is the place to watch out you'll get a nice beautiful hamper being sent over to you shortly um if you get it right that is so yeah that is something to look forward to and you will catch me later on in the entertainment corner where we will have a host of guests brian art terrell lewis and jade marie joseph all delivering a bit of entertainment and a few music videos from me. But until then, see you guys later. Bye -bye. Thank you, Captain. Okay, right. Um, what can I say about this? Uh, my first guest, oh God, pioneer, somewhat of a pioneer. He's a filmmaker, director, producer, journalist, writer, author, 
Oh, God, I did. I've, lo I've lost for words. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terry Jervis. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon, Pam. Good afternoon. Was that an intro or what? Did I miss anything out, though? Uh, you missed out that I did your show some years ago. I think I, I last did your show in 2010, I think it was. Cool. That so, far yeah. back, yeah. But look, first of all, let me tell you, uh, my heart goes out to uh, the family of those two women and uh, to many other mothers and fathers who lost their children under these violent circumstances. Um, and I am sure, given these times, there's strain on the police force, but like you said, we do deserve some answers which will help them in their leads to find the killer of this crime. And I think one of the things we don't talk about enough, uh, young black girls go missing. Uh, they talk about abuse in the, the home, the domestic violence and all these sorts of things. And we tend to forget that black women should be part of this discussion as well. And when we talk about institutionalized racism or the media, uh, well, actually, I would go as far as to say that they're complicit in all of this as well, because here you are, for the first time, I've actually seen those two women through your show. Um, I knew they were black, but uh, when I watched some of the news cycle, I never saw their images. So um, I commend you. Uh, I commend the team at Ben. And uh, throughout my career and my history, as you know, I've always tried uh, to make sure that we had equal representation, not just me as a black man in, in production, but I brought in many black women into production, whether it be in the music business or television or film or, or publishing, uh, so that you know we can have that balance, because we all care. We all care, and I think also we've got to look inside ourselves at our own communities and say, if you know something, you are equally as com uh, complicit if you don't say something, if you don't do something. So whilst we've got a pandemic going on, whilst we've got Black Lives Matter going on, I think we also should look at what's going on inside of us. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for that. Because, yeah, you know, we, we need to club together. We need to stick together. And, you know, we need to make sure that there isn't a madman out there, maybe targeting a certain you know, gender and a certain race. We don't know. No, we don't know. And uh, I think you've put out the call for the DCI. Yeah. Um, so let's see if he responds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for that. Now, let's talk about Terry the man. And you know what I wanted to, I want to really call you. I don't know if you're going to agree with this. I want to call you Sir Terry. <laughs> Terry, because you know you've done so much so we need to let people to know let's let's start at the beginning because you have done a lot and it's not just about what you've just done in the moment it's about what you've done in the past as well so can we please if you let, let me uh, i think give you the platform give you the mic and let's talk let's talk from the beginning because you your your, your title could be business and media uh, uh, entrepreneur but there's so much Listen. Yeah. Um, well, Listen. you know. <laughs> okay. So I guess for viewers who are seeing me for the first time, but you may know my shows like The Real McCoy or Top Gear or Top of the Pops or Smash Hits or Star Trek, and and working with Marvel Comics or or um, Def Jam Records or uh, being a Motown executive, uh, and even launching um, various channels for Sky Sport and uh, Trace TV. Um, and even supporting channels like yours with Ben. But I'm a former BBC executive. I was the youngest exec, I think, in their history at 27, running a department, uh, which the, the very first, um, what was then Afro-Caribbean unit, was a part of. But then I had my own department, which was special projects, which meant that the BBC essentially built a, 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 a unit around me because I was doing so many co-productions between uh, the UK and the USA and all over the world, really, um, from uh, Africa to the Caribbean to uh, islands like Mauritius and Seychelles and uh, selling into Australia, New Zealand and so on. Um, and then I went to work in Hollywood for a number of years and I still have very strong connections there. Um, and as you see behind me, uh, this is my my latest project, Spirit of the Pharaoh. 
Um, and uh, that's um, a book, uh, a, a book, <laughs> if I can do that, a graphic novel, which is going to be made yeah, into a film. I was going to come go to that a bit later. I want to talk yeah. a bit about your RAF connection. Uh, so, that's yeah, um, my RAF connection is, uh, you know, it's funny. I was recounting something the other day when they were talking about Churchill and Churchill's statue. And Churchill said uh, something to the effect of never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. And people forget they were pilots of the Caribbean. There were African and Caribbean people in the Navy and certainly, you know, in the Far East, you know, in the, the jungles of what is now Burma and uh, 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 Singapore and so on, uh, we were displaced all over the world. And people forget that Britain was an empire at that time. But anyway, I take Churchill's comments and I remember the few because I'm in living memory. Uh, I got here to this country, um, although I was born here, uh, my mother came because her, her, her first cousin, who was effectively like her brother, I, I kind of thought he was her brother because, you know, when I was young, he was always there. And I remember being in the classroom and when we were doing a project at eight years old, and it was about World War II, because I grew up on bomb sites in, in the early 1960s. People forget that, you know, there were still unexploded bombs. And I grew up in a poverty stricken area of Hackney and I would go and play on the bomb sites, literally on bombs. And I, I sometimes watched them detonate. Uh, so when you talk about high risk, I think just playing was high risk for us back then. Um, but uh, he trained to be a pilot in the Royal Air Force. And when I said in the classroom that there were black pilots in the Royal Air Force and I wanted to do a story about them, the teacher told me, stop talking rubbish. There were no black people involved in the war. Get outside, stand in the, the corridor and turn your face to the war. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's what I had to do for the whole afternoon. Wow. Tell me but, something. back to your parents, though, Terry, and said exactly what happened. What did your parents do? Um, well, my mother went to the school because, <laughs> you know, my mother's uh, a Jamaican and that kind of Jamaican defiance, I guess, is in me. And I, I was doing a big broadcast, uh, the world's biggest global broadcast. I was one of the executives on it. Um, which was the Millennium Day broadcast, bringing in the year 2000. And uh, after that broadcast, I saved the U.S., parts of the U.S. broadcast. I won't go into the detail of that. But but what I didn't realize was our, our, our satellite capability, our military satellite capability. Um, I got to meet um, a number of people from the Royal Air Force. We shared stories and... They were having a, a problem, a recruitment problem at the time. And I said I could solve it. And um, then I got recruited into the Royal Air Force. I came up with an idea. You know that red, white and blue um, logo, which uh, is, is that logo there. You can see this is the work I did with the red arrows. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So um, I basically created for the first time in its history, the Royal Air Force's merchandising and uh, uh, program. And uh, I, I actually um, worked with the Royal Air Force up until last year. I'm still, still very closely connected. Um, and then, you know, I did things like design and, and do things like a, a Starship with Rolls-Royce and the Royal Air Force and merchandise from that because I'm, mm, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you can see, um, so I'm the first person actually in their history to be allowed to use the RR in, in the starship there with, with Rolls Royce because I wanted to get certainly young black people and women, young women into science, technology, engineering and maths. And uh, that's definitely going to be our future if we look at the state of the planet. And also if we look at, you know, the condition we're in now, the, the kids studying now, their jobs for the future is going to involve something to do with technology or space. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got involved with the Royal Air Force. Yeah, 
Excellent. I mean, that's, that's an achievement in itself. We could even go on and on and on about everything that you've been involved in when it comes to TV and certain programs, whatever. But I do want to talk about now your big one, Spirit of the Pharaohs, because we need to get that in. The concept. In fact, let's talk about its birth. How did you come into this spirit of the Pharaohs? <laughs> well, um, in the 1980s, uh, there was a story. I used to read a lot of history books. I mean, we've got fantastic historians like Robin Walker, who, who did When We Rule, and uh, Tony Warner, who, who runs Black History Walks. That's in the present. But I grew up with people like uh, uh, Sheikh Hunter Diop, um, Ivan Van Sertema, uh, CLR James. Um, the destruction of black civilization, Chancellor Williams. And, and so I, I had a show at the time on BBC Two called Ebony. Um, not, not the magazine, but it was a magazine show. And uh, essentially what I did with that was I told our stories. And I remember uh, being sent on an assignment to, to Egypt. Well, and at that time, you know, when the BBC passed, um, was was something that uh, could get you access to a lot of places. I was given a, a sort of private tour of many, many tombs in, uh, in Egypt. And the thing that struck me was, yes, certain colors represent certain deities, you know, gods and, uh, you know, cultural rituals. Hmm. But it was very clear who these people were. They were African people. There's no denying. Um, you know, I I know that through the DNA testing on, on the mummies, they know this. And you see, when we talk about Black Lives Matter and dealing with injustices, you know, we're not saying, uh, for me, like I quoted um, Churchill, that these people were not socially relevant. And, and regardless of uh, what they said in their, their, their early years, and then fighting a war against fascism. And it's interesting to see that the fascists were actually peeing on the very statues they said they were there to protect. Uh, <laughs> so um, that the, the, their methods and, and motives are very questionable. But um, yeah, I think Spirit of the Pharaoh came to me because there's, you see, when you steal a people's history, you try and steal who they are. And then you try and appropriate the history as if it was yours. And we had no history before the transatlantic slave trade, which is ridiculous. Otherwise, uh, how would humanity have got where it is today? OK, so Spirit of the Pharaoh came from, first of all, that, that journey to, to Egypt. And then because I wanted to tell a modern story that young people could relate to that had its roots in our history and culture and uh, uh, was adventurous, was romantic. So it's a kind of, you know, Indiana Jones meets a Marvel movie meets a, a teen romance uh, uh, element. Images. Uh, I think Theo's going to put up some images as well, because not only that, you've got this, this, this jewelry as well. Um, depicting jewelry of, of, of our, our ancestors. Yes. Yeah. I mean, talk to us as we go through this. Well, that's that's two kilos of gold that we see there, which is the uh, the unk, um, the magical unk. Every pharaoh, uh, whether king or queen, was was buried with that. It's a key of life. It's a symbol of of the afterlife and the life force. That's the eye of Horus, the great eye of insight. That's gold, and and actually that. Um, uh, uh, silk was was taken from the very place where the ancient Egyptian kings and queens uh, got their silk. So we went there, we got the actual silk used to make the pharaonic clothing, and we brought it back. And funnily enough, those those um, statues there pieces, uh, no, the jewelry, the jewelry, uh, yeah. yeah, it's made by um, the uh, uh, ju uh, jeweler and the royal medalist to Her Majesty the Queen, which is why uh, they're all under royal warrant. And he and I have a, a partnership. When you, you were saying, uh, why am I not called Sir Terry? But actually, when I was working with Buckingham Palace, yeah. and I have to mention, you know, 
I did the abolition of the slave trade memorial service back in 2007 uh, with the Queen and uh, she laid the reef and I also had the Royal Navy send out uh, an aircraft carrier to the Atlantic mm -hmm. to um, drop a memorial reef into the Atlantic because I wanted um, to not only commemorate those of us who are surviving but you know we don't know how many was lost at sea you. you know for every one of us that survived you know there is probably three to six at the bottom of the ocean so we are the survivors of of a very long trauma yeah. and when people don't understand the rage and anger black people are feeling right now it's because we've lived with this history and yeah. we've had history denied and so spirit of the pharaoh has to deal with some of these issues we're in a pandemic right now mm -hmm. and and the basis of the story is that seth the god of chaos returns to earth to claim the souls of everyone on earth but he hasn't got the power to do so because those pieces of jewelry that you you just saw that we actually made for the movie um they have certain mystical powers and properties so uh he needs to defeat the pharaoh and queen nefakari to finally be able to take the souls of everyone on earth so what does he do he forms an alliance with an earthling a human being the world's richest man a billionaire who he says will help him to steal the souls of everyone on earth if seth will give him eternal life to rule over the earth right does it sound like a yeah. pandemic and those trying to yeah. uh, sell us well, stuff that uh, they think will cure us uh, um, so there's there's uh, deeper meanings in there it also deals with the issue of uh of uh, uh crime black, black on black crime as well because the hero in it is a young man living in south london who who is trying to make something of himself mm. and he gets caught up in in a lot of what's going on uh with young people but he finds the hero inside himself. Yeah. And let me tell you that every hero has a flaw. You know, that's what, what makes you become a hero. You notice a flaw, whether in yourself or something happened to you in, in society, mm -hmm. and you use that energy for the greater good. Yeah, yeah. Th th let's talk about, you spoke about the, the, the film. Uh, you know, when are we, can we expect to see the release? Well, of you know, uh, we, we have a bit of a problem now in the movie business because, of course, we're we're on shutdown. That's why you and I are, yeah. are, are talking like this. And uh, I think the pictures you just showed were from a, a, a couple of years ago um, when we did the, the the Tamara soiree. Was it a couple of years or yeah. a year ago? Well, was um, it last year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, 2019, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, I've been in lockdown. Look, that's me. That's me. And uh, Reginald, Reginald Maynard. Now, now, this is important. Just, just keep this picture up for a minute. Um, so when I knew what was happening uh, with the movie business, I formed an alliance with um, probably the, the single biggest black hair and beauty company in the U.S. That's Reginald Maynard of Luster Products uh, International. And uh, since then, we've become very good friends. And, you know, they sponsored Spirit of the Pharaoh because, again, it's about the origin of beauty. Of course. Ancient Egypt was the first to record beauty techniques of course. that the world celebrates even to this day. That's right. So I went to a black company to say, right, yes, there are the Revlons and, and the Johnsons and, and the L'Oreal's. But I wanted to make sure that we built something that we own, not to the exclusion of anyone else, because Lusters makes products for European, Mediterranean, and African here, as well as Asian here. Yes. They make products for everybody. Just like me, I make, I make TV and media and, 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 and radio and publishing for everybody. But it comes from my perspective which is a different perspective on the world. And actually, with 4.2 billion people having watched my shows around the world or bought something or listened to something, it shows you that, you know what, a black man can appeal to 
you know, half the world, more than half the world's population. Yeah, yeah indeed. Indeed. Yeah, we, we saw you with that, as you say, with um, Reggie. Uh, from uh, Lusters. Now, he, he was on the show, I must tell you, a couple of weeks ago, he was bigging up your, you know, he was bigging yeah, up. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know what, well, Pam, because yeah. I'm, I'm doing it with Lusters, can I, have a, can I have a full screen, please? Give me a full screen. Let me let me show you, you know, something. Come on, let's see him. Look, yeah. you Go and on. I, you and I have got locked down here. Look, my hair needs, my hair needs some serious packing, right? And, 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 and your hair might be able to deal with some, say, coconut oil right now, all right? What are you going to say? I look good. Uh, 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 no, you look fantastic, right? Oh. But, 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 and, and I tell you what, I tell you what, I, I've even, I've even got men's products here, right? Lusters, Lusters sent me some emergency stuff, but I couldn't get to use it in time for this interview, right? Uh, so this is like 360 styling, and I, I, I got uh, shave gel, and oh, here we go. Uh, for men, so and they even do things for kids. I mean, a lot of women will know this bottle, pink, um, and yeah. and and uh, pink kids, right? Yeah. And and so look, the great thing about this this alliance is that I make shows for children, teenagers, and adults, and I'm with a brand in Lustre that's been going for sixty three years. Oh my God, I've just got to tell yeah. you, Reggie has sent a message. We are truly proud to be in association with Terry and J-E-M, Gem Media. Yay! <laughs> oh, right. Oh, hi, Reggie. I didn't realize you were on the line, but that's good. And he's in Chicago, so he's probably just woken up. <laughs> exactly. Imagine that. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, yeah, no, and, and look, it's a, it's a beautiful relationship because I just want to show black people I don't need to talk to white people because, as I say, I work with the Rolls Royces, the Airbuses, the Royal Air Force, Buckingham Palace, BBC, um, all the Hollywood studios. And, I, I, and I, I'm in a, uh, a partnership with J.K. Rowling's uh, manager. We're, we're launching a new media company. Um, those things to me are not, are not the issue. That's, that's what I do for a living. Yes. What I realize that has to be done is I have to commit myself to training up more people. I have to commit myself to making sure Luster Products gets to those places in the world that I visited, like Australia and some of the islands of the Pacific region that are crying out for this, this product. And for people like me, with this experience in, in music, film, television, publishing, because their voices are not heard and they suffered the same colonial experiment that we did. Right. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, I think people have to wake up that this is now a global movement and it will grow. And it's not like we're saying we matter any more than others. Exactly. We're saying that we now are standing up because we are showing you what justice will look like. What diversity in strength will look like what it looks like when we align and have economic power yes. what it looks like when we make stuff that educates our children right. that makes it clear that when people like you stand up and say two people are dead and we need some answers this is why i support what you do and i make alliances with luster and i have all of those things and trust me i don't shy away because everybody I deal with, in fact, you know, I was on the phone last night with one of the senior vice presidents of Rolls Royce, another person from Airbus, uh, my my business and partner uh, that we're going to make uh, jewelry under a royal warrant from the Queen. Uh, that is specifically about things to do with us, okay? And we're going to make those pieces as investment pieces. And fortunately, Luster has come on board, and we're bringing in the Tuskegee Airmen as well as the pilots of the Caribbean. I'm in living memory of all these people. I filmed with the Tuskegee Airmen. I filmed with the uh, pilots of the Caribbean. Sadly, they've all now passed away. But this luster and spirit of the Pharaoh and Gem Media game plan is we want to create agents of change. Agents who are going to go and sell the product but can be part of the movie, can make the music for it. You know, I got people as far away as Australia working on music. 
I've got my, my guy here, Scully, you know, working on music for a number of things that I'm doing from the children's show to the fact that he did the soundtrack for my Venus and Serena Williams movie, right? Remember, I was the first person to do the movie about Venus and Serena Williams and their father. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I try to involve people who would never get that chance. Like I never got that chance. I started in this business with comic books and then I ended up working with Marvel yes. and DC and Warners. I grew up listening to Sam Cooke and I made the first Sam Cooke um, documentary of which President Obama used the song A Change Is Gonna Come for his presidential campaign. And I got a presidential watch uh, uh, signed by Obama. So um, I want to say to people, hope has arrived. And I'm going to be releasing a song with Patty Austin, Quincy Jones's God Data. And God Data, you hear me, Jimmy? Can I come out now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was kind of getting to get that radical space. <laughs> the God Data. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, with Quincy Jones's goddaughter and uh, and and Luster, uh, and and we're actually going to give that song away free. We're going to use uh, social media through companies like uh, DDPR, Tamara, uh, 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 you, um, and uh, 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 that dude De Lambert, and a number of other uh, entities and organisations that we work for under Luster's machinery to give this song away and say hope has arrived. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, I, I specifically chose Patty because Patty Austin, just Google her name and you'll see she's worked with just about everybody. And if you've ever seen the movie 20 Feet from Stardom about the history of the black female singers, you'll see her in it. Right. Well, and, you, and, 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 you know, you know I have to, I could talk to you, you know, I can talk to you all day. People want to hear more about you. But where can people um, read? up about you give us some of your social media uh details uh they can go to um spirit of the pharaoh.com all right so that's www.spiritofthepharaoh.com or they can go to jervismedia.com uh or they can just google terry jervis and find me in a hundred great black britons Exactly, of course they could. <laughs> which, which, which is great. There's another one we must celebrate, Patrick Vernon, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, because, you know, again, you know, whilst I'm out here doing these things, we've got people like Patrick Vernon, Tony Warner, Robin Walker, um, uh, this this lady, good friend of mine, uh, she she's done this this book about the, the story of black hair, of uh, uh, black hair across the ages. And, you know, people forget, you know, black hair is not any one type. And and um, so I just want to say to people, look, uh, I think what you're doing is fantastic. I'm glad I did this show. Yeah. I want to say to all the people out there watching this show, hope has arrived. The future starts now. It's how we shape it. It doesn't just happen because you're asking, you know, a system to change. We can do it. And we can affect the system of change. We must become the agents of change. So I'll end by saying, if we're going to become the agents of change, remember how this show started with that appeal um, to find the murderer or murderers of those two young women. Yeah, yeah, cool. That's one. Terry, as ever, thank you. Sir Terry, <laughs> I stay safe. And we'll stay catch safe, up. Stay safe, man. We'll catch up. Okay. Bye-bye. Um, Okay, wow, well, I could talk to Terry all day long. You know this. Um, he does a great pioneer. So many things that's going to be coming up as well. Big and huge things. Spirit of the Pharaoh, great thing. Google him, you know, get on his website, look more about him. We, we, oh, just was uh, running, 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 running. So I'll be back after this.
now on lifestyle, our debate on Black Lives Matters continue. Um, obviously, we all know it's, it was kicked off uh, by the brutal racism and, and uh, uh, tragic murder of a uh, 46-year-old George Floyd in uh, uh, Minneapolis in the States and while well, being detained by four officers. Police officers have been arrested. One of them has been charged for second-degree murder. We all probably know that by now. But what we want to do, we're, we're looking at certain things. We, we know it's headline news across the globe. We know protest marches and things like that's been taking place. Statues have been uh, torn up over here and in the, and in the States as well. And uh, uh, various individuals connected to uh, the, uh, dark passes, if you will, their dark and unsavory past, um, have been pulled down. And, and talks are being uh, taking place uh, about let's do, perhaps doing it better, perhaps doing it correctly. Uh, by, you know, having these talks about various uh, statuettes and what they imply um, and about taking them off and maybe putting them in a museum. So, but what what we're asking now, what what should the level on the agenda be now? What, what What's on the, the agenda? Where, where, where should we be now? And also what direction would you like to see the movement head on to? So joining me in, in the studio, uh, oh, by the way, I should let you know that the second half of this debate Again, we're going to, like we did last week, we're going to uh, ask you to please send in your questions and comments. You had a huge response last week. I hope you can have that again this week. Uh, send in your comments or questions and you can do that. Um, what we need you to do is either go on to the uh, um, YouTube and that's the MediaNet Live, YouTube channel, MediaNet Live, Facebook page, Lifestyle on Ben, email, Lifestyle on Ben, all one word, Lifestyle on Ben at Hotmail doco.uk right now hopefully we've got the panel up in here joining me on the lifestyle show today we have pastors michael and marjorie king of the king of kings international ministries in croydon entrepreneur rihanna thompson dr jackie jeffries head of business studies at middlesex university and lifestyle features correspondent norman basingu are we all in are we all in norman hi hello, hello. Michael and, and Marjorie, thank you for joining me. Lovely to see you. Rihanna, thank okay. you for joining us. Lovely to see I you. Love to see Yay. Thank you. Uh, we're missing, uh, hopefully she can join us later, Dr. Je Jackie Jeffries. Um, but but let's, let's kick off. Let's kick this thing off now. Um, I just posed two questions. I just said, what level should the agenda be now with the Black Lives Movement? What direction? do we want to see it, it heading on to? And, you know, just for the sake of the fact that, um, you know, there's two of you there, Michael, Marjorie King, do, would you like to respond to that one initially? Yes, um, it's a strong point. What direction next? It's a powerful question, powerful point, because the world is standing up and saying no more. The world is standing up and saying we've seen this injustice, this in, inhumanity. We've seen this wickedness and murder and we're not accepting it. But the real question is what happens next? And for me personally, as a Christian, we always have this thing that's difficult for people, which is forgiveness. The Christ said we must forgive in the Lord's prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us. But within that forgiveness, is a degree of us asking for an understanding and recognition of the wrongs done by the perpetrators, not just the officers, but their organizations, not just the organizations, but wider society and all it ills. And as a Christian, we ask for godly change from the top down. So for me personally, the force has to really reassess how it operates and it owes a massive apology to the people it's supposed to protect. In fact, it's not supposed to be a police force, it's supposed to be a police service, both here in the UK and in America. And then there needs to be a change educationally amongst the nation. People have to understand Black Lives Matter is part of black history that's not told. The truth is never told. Even taking things like Windrush here, we talk about Windrush. My father was the founder of the Windrush Yes, yes. foundation yes, and yes. most people don't the wind rush brought people to rebuild the mother country and the vast majority of people on wind rush were ex-service people and no one says that these people fought in the second world war and were invited to rebuild the mother country 
So my point is when black history is told, black people have a different pride in themselves and the indigenous populations have a higher regard and better understanding of the relationships that we can form together going forward. Mm -hmm. And with a Christian underpinning, we mm -hmm. do it all with love. It changes things with love. I love Martin Luther. He, he yeah. did peaceful protests, but strong protests and love yeah. was underpinning yeah. everything. Michael. You had the dream of little white boys and little white girls to play together. And the reality is little white girls and little white boys don't have a problem. It's, well, yeah. it's the indoctrination of society that changes things. Yeah. As a My, Christian, I say, if everybody was a born again, I mean, you know, know what we're doing time. Don't have a problem. Talking, it's going, it's going, we're losing a bit of time with it. I don't know what's, what the problem is because when you talk, it's coming out of, you know, you're not in sync. With, with things. So I don't know, I want to talk to Marjorie a, a minute, but I think maybe I'm going to ask Theo, our tech guy, to sort that out. Marjorie, I'll come back to you because, you you know, it's like, you, you know, your second's off. So I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to come back to you. Rihanna, um, right, the, the, the questions posed there. What, what would you say then, um, forward, forward thinking, where do we go now? Where should we be heading to now? I think Reverend Michael King actually summed it up quite well. I think there's three steps to where we go from here, and it starts with the truth. So the truth needs to be told as to the system that we're living in, as well as the history of our people. And then I think the next step would be forgiveness. And I think if there's any evidence as to what Black people are like, we're very forgiving. They are protesting or rioting in central London because they want to protect statues. Whereas when you go to Egypt, all the pharaohs are missing their nose and no one wants to address it. So in my opinion, you can see how we as a people react to the defacement of our statues and you can see how they react. They're violently attacking police officers, because the protesters haven't shown up in the mass, so to speak, for the Black Lives Matter movement. And then also, um, so sorry to hear about those two women in the park, but you can see why people would want to stay home and protect their children and stop them from going out and protesting on Saturday, because that is the level that they're allowed to behave at. And the Equality Act of the UK is not even being enforced at this point. Like their behavior is illegal in its essence and no one's addressing it. Not, none of the politicians are addressing it. The truth of our history needs to be addressed. There's so many pieces missing from the African timeline before slavery. We all know it was the greatest empire. We all know that they stole civilization and then called us monkeys. Mm -hmm. We all know that Masa Musa was one of the richest man or is still the richest man known. In, in the history of the world. And what he did was on his pilgrimage, he gave away gold and he was being generous, but what they saw was an opportunity to come into Africa and reap that for themselves. Mm -hmm. So the truth needs to be told about our history, which is so vast and so complicated that the entire education system needs to be rewritten. Of course. I, I have an entirely different issue with the, the schooling system, sorry, not the education system. <laughs> Tell you the truth, though, because we spoke about this last week as well, Rihanna, with, with the, the members um, that we had on the panel last week. We keep talking about this. We need to. It's, it's great to have a Black History Month, but we need to roll on with Black History per se on the curriculum. So at this point, I'm going to bring in um, Norman. Norman, you've been going about features correspondent Norman uh, Basinger. You've been going around. You've been talking to people. You've been talking to mothers. You've been talking to people that have been on these marches. Um, when it comes to, you know, black history, when it comes to the educational system in this country, how much people are really pushing for this and what, what are they asking for? What are they, how are they going to do? How are we going to change it? How are we going to, what are we going to? That's a very fair question, Pam. And first of all, I'd like to agree with the, um, the, the other comments raised about changes need, that need to be made with the education system and what's going on. There are two things that I think we need to really think about as far as the future. One of them is really looking to the law because a large part of the protests are calling for widespread systemic change to help overcome the racial injustice to prevent these instances happening again and again and again, because it's almost like being in a time loop, like we had, uh, just to name some examples, Eric Garner in 2014, Alton Sterling in 2016, and Stefan Clark in 2018. So oh, it's- No, 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 no
Yeah. So yeah, so with regards to where we need to go, I think it's two things. One, really looking to the law, and secondly, really utilizing the power of social media and youth in orchestrating this change, and that's what we've been seeing. So with regards to my first point about looking at the law, um, Eric Garner passed away on the 25th of, of May, and it's, only, it's not even been a month yet, but from that time, we've seen wide, we've seen a great amount of legal change that's taking place in America, and I want to list a few things because I think this is the direction that we need to go in as, insofar as combating the systemic um, issues that are at play, and I think this trend has to continue. So to list a few, for example, the Democratic leaders and state assembly of the Senate have reached an agreement on 10 bills um, related to police conduct, including a ban on police chokehold. So hopefully that'll prevent that instance of what we saw all in the viral video happening again. And I think that's a very important step. It's a deterrent, it's something that's illegal now. It's something that if you do that, you'll be terminated, there might be further legal repercussions. So that's a very important step that has to take place. Um, in New York, um, the New York City Council leaders have declared their intention to slash one billion in annual police funding and aims to reroute it to youth social programs. That again is very important. Where is the money going? If it's not going to the police departments, how is it being redistributed back into the community to ensure that people have the opportunities to excel? You know, in, in, in the Black African community, we speak a lot about generational wealth and keeping wealth, you know, Black business and entrepreneurship and how do we get wealth back into our communities? Well, the redistribution of wealth from the council back into the local community, I think, is a very important step. And what New York has shown there, I think, could potentially be the start of something great there, should it materialise in that way. And, and one last example. Um, you know, um, um, we're seeing in Minnesota, um, you know, a resolution to replace the police department with a community led public safety system. I think that's very important. And again, all of these things with a very specific law focus, I think, are the way that things need to go. It will be slow and it will be gradual. But I think given that we're all operating within this system, this is the way that it has to go. And we're seeing that within a month of the incident of George Floyd. We're seeing real tangible change. So now it's about continuing that. In regards to my second point, um, just to be quick here, um, the power of social media. What we're seeing now with the use of Twitter, Instagram, social media, this couldn't have happened 50 or 60 years ago where the great leaders of yesteryear, for example, Martin Luther King, they didn't have social media, they didn't have smartphones or things like that. So the spread of information, the spread of, of, of awareness is so instant now. And if I look at some of the pros that we've seen from social media, let's look at donations and e-petitions. The George Floyd Memorial Fund smashed its 1.5 million goal and became the most donated GoFundMe page on the website. Again, it's not even been a month since um, he passed away. So that shows you the power of social media. And again, things like Blackout Tuesday on social media, celebrities, um, companies, people really using their online voices to spread awareness and to really highlight the change that needs to occur. So in yeah. some, I think it's those two things. Mm -hmm. The law and the reliance on the legislature within particular countries or, or, or governments will be what have you to really spearhead that change so that it's cemented so that the systemic issues can begin to erode away and secondly the use of social media and really the power of youth in driving forward awareness and, and information mm -hmm. excellent excellent um marjorie can we get you now i don't know whether we fixed the 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 the, the, the sink but i don't know but Anyway, I want to talk to you now. You, 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 you know, you and Michael, uh, parents of six children. So when you talk about, <laughs> I mean, come on, when you talk about education and when you, you are obviously teaching your children black history, but it should be done in school. So what are you looking at now in change? If we're using, we can use what's going on now to our advantage and look at the educational system in the UK and demand change and to get black history onto the curriculum. How would you help that to happen as well, Marjorie? Well, I definitely believe that where we can begin is by putting up more black statues, um, like we're tearing down black statue, um, white statues right now, but we need to put up some more black history black statues that mean something. And one of them I'd like to do right now is putting up Sam King for Windrush Square. Um, I think that's important that they, you know, he, that there should be a statue there and, you know, what he stands for, because he's the founder of the Windrush. So therefore he, sh there should be a statue. And we've, uh, I was looking it up and we've got 21 um, monumentaries black statues, but we haven't got enough. We've got Mary Seacles, um, and I, you know, I'm trying to teach my children there's there's other black um, people with statues, but there, there isn't enough. There isn't enough around England right now. Mm. And then the, um, and the other thing they wanted to talk, um, do is call it Diversity Month, with which black history. We fought hard, 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 
card for Black History Month. And now what I found that the society has been trying to do for the last four years is turn it into diversity month. If you want to have diversity month, they should have a diversity month for, for another month, another time. But we black people, there's people died, they sweat for black history. And we need to keep black history month and celebrate that we, we people have died for us, died for the cause. Um, I've had to go to, um, a few schools and had to speak to a few schools and say to them, look, um, there's no way you're going to call it diversity month when and and that the ch children don't even know black history. Exactly. Diversity month should be another time, another place, another, you know, another a month, another month, but not black history month. Yeah, not that um, we, um, we, we had about 20 teachers and two black women. I protested outside the school and gave out leaflets and everything for all parents to turn up and they didn't turn up but me and two other parents we put a stop to it at the school can you hear me yeah can you all hear me I can okay you. You're, you're, we, we put a stop to it. we we put a we put a stop to the schools anyway uh, and uh it was it was an achievement, even though it took two of us, it was a massive achievement because they didn't turn it into um, diversity month and the children can know that there is a black history. But when it comes to black history month, they do very little in the schools, very, very little on the subject. And that's why you don't have the children now not knowing their di identity. The, the, the other, gen that my, my children's generation do not have an identity of black history. You've got to force it upon them. You've got to, you know, I've, I've had to put posters all around in their playroom of black history of men who um, who have defound the the uh, the, um, the lights and black men who discovered the fridge. You know, they didn't know these things. You know, there's as a, as a black boy in Norbury, he discovered he discovered Nike, Nike. Yeah, but um, you've got in, the, in the, the white people who's taken that Nike and used it for him and paying him being behind the scenes. But it was a black boy who designed the, the Nike tick. You yeah. know, we yeah. could go on and on and on about on the on. things at we've point, discovered. Marjorie, at this point, Marjorie, I want to bring in, I think she's on now, Dr. Jackie Jeffries, um, Head of Business Studies, Middlesex University. Are you with me, Jackie? Are you on? Hi there, Jackie. Lovely, uh, lovely to see you. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, at this point, I've got to just quickly tell you that we were discussing. Um, are you are you set? Are you with me? Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, we we were discussing um, sort of Black history onto the school curriculum. Uh, this is the point we were at before we can go into another break because the viewers are commenting and they've got questions. But Jackie, can you talk to us about that? Because we were saying, where is the, the, the movement going? Where What is the next agenda? Then we started looking at uh, 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 um, Black uh, uh, history in, onto the curriculum. Can you give us your insight on that as well? I, I, I welcome and say hi to everybody. Um, I don't actually, I wouldn't agree um with those statements and there's a lot of reasons for that and one of the key ones is the schools are not equipped to teach us our history because teachers are not taught to teach subjects they are taught to teach the national curriculum now we've got people out there like mr walker who spoke at my university who can educate parents so we can educate our children and then we can go into schools and educate schools and educate society. I'm kind of tired of expecting the system that isn't designed for us to suddenly come right for us, where if we want something done, then we have to take more responsibility for getting those messages out there and for equipping ourselves to know that. So I, I kind of dream of training lots and lots of parents to know how to, I don't know, deliver Kwanzaa and then them going into schools all over the country where their children are and wherever it is so that everybody knows what Kwanzaa is before Kwanzaa happens. I'm more interested in our parents going in and doing that stuff than I'm expecting any European school to educate my children. Okay. So I, I have a slight... Um, a yeah, slight I'm going to get an opinion from somebody 
Rihanna, the Rihanna. way that I see we need to go forward. Okay. Because I, I, I studied behavioral economics as well. Yeah. We need to think far more strategically about how we use our money. And I love the fact that everybody's excited. And I love the fact of this issue about the black pound. But okay. I don't know about other people, yeah. but my payday is usually around the end of the month. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> no, you think that it should be the end of the month. Jackie, hold on one moment. Rihanna, I want her to respond to what you're saying. That is not about, you know, the, the schools uh, are, are training our children because they don't know it. Um, uh, uh, and we, the parents should be training. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. What would you say? So what I'd say to that is, in, in one instance, I do agree with Jackie. And that's, this is also why I say that black people as a whole getting organized is going to be important because we've, we've all got important messages and perspectives that need to be dealt with when we start putting them online. Um, I feel like if we were in a position as a people to homeschool our children, then I would agree that we take more responsibility. If the government were funding youth schools, then I would agree again, like I know Robin Walker does work um, Saturday schools and stuff teaching history. Now that we have the tools on the internet to create courses, I do believe that it would be easier for us to create a holistic course, whether we're getting a Carla, uh, Robin Walker, whoever it is to create the curriculum that is cohesive and um, covers all of the history and putting that online so that when the children come home from school, they're prioritizing that, then yes, I agree. But to ask working class parents when the system is, is designed to I take away their that. time mm -hmm. and, and keep them in a certain spot to find the time to do that as well, like they need to be educating themselves. And obviously the children would have a different curriculum um, based on uh, the, the level of, of the atrocities they can be exposed to. I mean, um, if we go to Norman again, you can t talk to us uh, briefly on that one. Jackie, Dr. Jackie Jeffrey says that, um, no, she doesn't trust her children to be taught in, t in a European uh, classroom, a British classroom, and, and we parents should be responsible to do that. Would you agree with that? I, I, I was wondering whether or not then we start retraining the teachers. We, we train the teachers, they are trained, they educate themselves in black history, and so they, they can do that in the classroom. What would you say to that, Norman? <laughs> Everyone has raised some very interesting I, I, points, and there's no for all. Um, I think, first, like, in my personal circumstance, I'm aware of the history from the transatlantic slave trade to abolitionism. These are things that I studied on, on my own behalf because I was completing an extended project qualification in A-levels. I remember when I was in school, we were taught about the Tudors, we were taught about, um, say, Henry VIII and the royal family and the royal lineage, but nothing about the British Empire. And it's, you know, there's interesting points raised here because on the one hand, as it was said, it's difficult to try and rework the entire curriculum. And I think even though it would be ideal, I think if we look at the current climate we're in right now, especially with COVID in the midst of a pandemic, um, you know, a forecast of recession to, to hit the country, will it be able, will, will, will we be in a position to actually implement those changes? Ideally, that would be great. But if we look at practicalities, will it be able to have that kind of wide scale change? It might be quite difficult. So in lieu of that, if we can't, then it turns back to the alternative. So let's say having online courses and um, having alternatives in place. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult one because we're in very unprecedented times yeah. and pushing change as widespread as this where you're adapting the curriculum. Because personally, I would love to see it. I think it's very important that people here understand what the British um, British Empire did and how it colonised most of the world and the part that it played. Let's say with the scramble of Africa, for example, in the, 20, in, in, in the 1900s, you know, how it carved Africa, set up protectorates and, and colonies and, you know, you know, what it did, both pros and cons. But I think moving forward, um, it might be quite challenging in this COVID climate. So we have to look at alternatives like e-resources. And it's difficult because where does the onus lie? Does, does it lie on the state or on the individual to, to equip themselves with the knowledge? I taught myself, but it, it comes down to is it the onus on the state versus the individual? And that I can't answer at this stage because I'm not entirely sure. Okay. At this point, Norman, and, and to the rest of you guys, please stay where you are. We have to take this little break now. We have told viewers um, to... to sending their questions to give us their comments. And at this point, we're going to get some of their questions and comments come out. As we just do a little bit of a, a briefing here, we just stop for a few seconds and we're gonna come back.
Okay, welcome back. Um, right, so I've got some already, and that's, I see there's more There's more going on here, but I've got some already, but there's more coming through. Okay, um, I know you just wanted to say something very quickly about the uh, the schools and the, uh, the, the Black History uh, being put on the curriculum. You had something else to come up with. What were you saying? I think we was in that little bit of a break, and I heard you um, discussing that. What did you want to say? Right, okay, so a bit about the education. I totally agree that the school should be teaching our children. But a degree takes um, four years to get. In that four years, another child, another person dies, another issue takes place. So what I'm suggesting is that we take responsibility for educating our children until the system is caught up. Because mm -hmm. my, my daughter turned 20 this year, and I remember having these conversations when she began school at the age of five. We're still having the conversations. My oldest child is 30. She's still having those conversations. So all I'm suggesting is that we, in the interim, while these people get act together, that the way that we force them to get their act together is that we act in a strategic way and that we take more time and energy to look after ourselves rather than expecting other people do because they will never look after you better than you look after yourself yeah. and then where you really want to hit them if if i get to play um is i love this idea of the black pound and and this idea of our, our they have no impact people are going to lose interest and they win again so I'm looking at us thinking about things strategically. So we are the first people. Um, Terry was on and, and explained the issue about the theorists. There's no doubt in history or in fact that we are the first people. So why don't we claim the first of the month? Why don't the first of the month we do our big focus every single month? Now, if you imagine, I get paid at the end of the month and there's loads of people that get paid at the end of the month. Imagine it, instead of running to Tesco's and the Sainsbury's and Waitrose, we went to our shops and we spent our money. If they don't have the product, we educate our shoppers, our people. So usually I would buy this, 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 and it would cost me this, this, this. That gives them a month as business people to get products on their shelves that their customers are going to want. Now, this is not only about black people because as terry was saying lustra produces products for everybody but anybody who cares if we use our money on the best day when they're used to making their most of us because remember we do our big shop we go and buy our clothes we go and do this we go and do that all on payday imagine if that was all going into one pot instead of theirs yeah Every Every huge, single huge, month. Huge. But we do know that they're it saying that change the, the behavior of everybody. Jackie, Jackie, they're saying the blacker they want it to Sorry? start from the 15th of June to the 21st of June. And what they are saying is that um, please do spend your money in a black owned outlet um, for that particular week. I just well, we want don't own the means. Of, listen, exactly. but Jackie, I'm, let me I'm try to play. Exactly, yeah. Jackie. I need to. I need to talk. Get, get these these out now because. The, these people are calling and and uh, they're, they're sending me the things. Uh, Hendon, um, uh, in Hendon, Ian uh, comments, we not only want to see a change in our judicial and political system, we want to see equality across the spectrum. And he's saying uh, schools, housing, health services, sports, music, and proper representation in the media. That last bit I'd like to talk about, proper representation in the media. How many times has it gone so drastic? with how we are represented okay. and how when the news comes out how it's twisted so can, can i just first of all ask rihanna to to respond on that yes i think let me give you um, an example the the under the law court, under stop and jackie rules, jackie, re jackie rihanna is responding let rihanna respond go on rihanna um, I was saying at the core of a lot of the issues that black people face, there's capitalism. Now, unfortunately, the capitalists also control the media, which is why we have this reoccurring issue of blacks being misrepresented. So it was really interesting listening to you talk to Terry. But like I said, we need to organize all of the people that we have that are representing us correctly in the media, put them together and get them on platforms like your own, because the Internet has changed the game. So whilst they can control the media and they can twist the stories, now, because, because we have such a mass following as a diaspora, we can actually get the truth out. And if we do it in a 
systematic way and, and we have a network that is sharing to larger platforms and people are reposting that and keep the conversation going the same way that it's going now, I do think that we'll be able to change that. But as far as the larger cor corporations, it's gonna be very difficult to get them to actually change their tune because the people who pay them uh, benefit from us being in the position that we're in. Yeah, yeah. Norman, can I bring you in at this point? Because we've okay. seen quite exact, huge that's happened. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. just this week alone, Thursday, um, I should say, uh, a, a presenter on LBC uh, by the name of Nigel Farage. He was ousted. Now, he had very positive and, should I say, positive views for himself, negative views for us. But this is a part and parcel of the media. LBC had so many complaints, they were forced to, to let him step down. So this is what we're talking about in the media. Yeah. Now it's suddenly, uh, everybody's suddenly realised, you know, look, look in the Capitol um, floor, look in the newsroom of the Capitol Radio. Oh, where? Spot the black. Come on. It's been there. We, we know what it's about. But mm. the, we need impact now. Yes. And um, proper representation with yes. the media. And to build on that, Pam, so thank you for raising that point. So it comes back to this, this concept of diversity and inclusion within the corporate space and across industries and whatever sector we're talking about. Now, for me, this I'm privy to this conversation because I received an award in 2017 titled the Miranda Braun Diversity Leadership Scholarship. And it recognizes me as a future diversity leader in the legal industry. So with Miranda Braun, who's a diversity champion in, in law, banking and so on and so forth, you know, she really pushes for change. And it's one of those conversations where it's going to take time because we have to come back to this keyword of things being systemic. So, you know, um, there aren't many of us at the top tiers. And that's why, you know, as you're talking about misrepresentation, there might be one or two of us that are there. And the unfortunate instance occurs whereby if that one person makes a mistake, say they're on the BBC or ITV or, or some big platform that everyone tunes into, if they make one small slip up, then we can be quite unforgiving to them because it's like, but you're the one and you made the mistake and now we all look kind of look bad, which isn't fair, which isn't a fair um, sort of responsibility or onus to put on one individual, but that's unfortunately how things have played out for so long. So to, 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 to overcome this issue, diversity and inclusion has to be a big conversation and it has to be both ways. It can't just be um, the, my, th those classified as BAME um, knocking on the door, but it has to be the people on the other side of the door really recognizing there's a significant business interest in them having BAME candidates as far as um, how it can be, how are their companies received if we look at corporate social responsibility or, you know, um, you know, the business benefits that it can bring to them. So yeah. it's definitely a two way conversation. But for me personally, diversity and inclusion across the industry. So even the media industry, for example, having more mentors, having more schemes, greater accessibility, these practical steps. Um, you know, we talk a lot about quotas, um, whether or not quotas are a good thing or not. This idea of we're going to take on at least five, you know, that meets um, mixed reviews. Some say it's good, it's affirmative action. It means that at least some people can get in the door versus some saying, well, no, it's a tick box exercise. Well, I think quotas are at least a start, but there's more to be done. And again, I think through mentoring, through accessibility, and I think through going down the chain of time. So, you know, um, if we if we go back down to schools, for example, you know, um, when I look at particular industries I was exposed to, so law in particular, I was on a, a, a law program that was sponsored by um, very big um, firms in the city. And that gave me my exposure to the legal industry. There are no lawyers in my family. And I was very fortunate to get on that program. That isn't the case for everyone, right? And I got mentors. So I think that's how things have to be. Accessibility um, and, 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 and a greater focus on diversity and inclusion across the board and that conversation being had. There are things being done now, but there's definitely room for more to be done. Yeah, and, and moving forward, we need to see more more change, and we need to quite yes. quite quickly. Um, now, Pauline from Croydon Arcs, and this is going to be the, the kings here because she's saying that yeah, we've seen a, the actor um, uh, 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 Star Wars actor come up. She's saying we've seen actors and we've seen personalities come up and be at these rallies and be at these peace protests. But they haven't seen enough of the church representing. So. Uh, um, you know, Michael, Marjorie, you want to respond to that? Needing to see more of the church in you know, rallies, maybe talking, I don't know, but they want to see more representation of the church. The church were there yesterday, Pastor Sims was ah. at the mark yesterday with a number of other pastors to make sure that the children were safe, the young people were safe. So, and, and at the other marches, the pastors were there in Croydon, all the pastors turned out. 
uh, and marched. And at some of the marches, Black Lives, pastors were there marching as well, alongside with others. Uh, we support and we march with these things in a peaceful and correct fashion. Um, so I would say to her, I, I must say, um, Pauline and Croyd in my area, pastors are there every single march and, and uh, um, it's, it's a fallacy to believe that we're not. And, and on the education point, so I've got to bounce back to that one and say to you that Windrush is now part of the national curriculum for up to the, um, the primary school level. We're fighting to get that into secondary school. And I would say with the Black Lives situation as it is, we should attack the national curriculum to have black history in its entirety. Now's the time that the powers that be that make those decisions will listen. So two points, education, we can change things at curriculum level. It's already done with Windrush. And it's only from last year that this has happened. It's part of the national curriculum, the true story. And pastors are at every march. And, and to let you know, this pastor used to be in my youth, the national front. Center. I was at every march when I was on save. And we went and fought the national front everywhere, all over London and South East England. And it was with Rock Against Racism. It was with uh, other alliances, anti-Jewish leagues and many others, and mainly white people. But this pastor used to be at all the marches fighting as an unsaved person. Now I go to marches and there's no fighting. There's praying for the other side and there's being very orderly. Yeah, excellent. Um, are we going to uh, talk about, uh, maybe this is a slightly negative thing, but I don't know because I ask people to respond to this with any comment or any questions they want to ask. So uh, what we've got is we've got um, Clayton from, um, um, it looks like Boreham Wood. Um, what would be the end result to all this rallying and violence on our streets? What difference can it make to society today? <laughs> Who wants to respond? Oh, can I jump in there? Can I jump in there? So again, two things. So um, when I first spoke, I spoke about the legal changes that we're seeing taking effect. Again, George Floyd passed away on the 25th of May. It's not been a month yet. And we've seen already some great changes happen in America. Um, I, rest, I listed them already. Um, one example being um, the Senate reaching agreement on 10 bills related to police conduct, including a ban on police chokeholds. I'll just give that as one example. That is a practical outcome. George Floyd died because an officer knelt on his neck for eight minutes and 45 seconds, and it was shown in the post-mortem and, 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 and test done that, yes, that, played, that, that was the reason why he passed, right? So to answer that gentleman's question, that individual's question, the, the legal change is a very important factor in what needs to happen, and we're seeing it already. Does it need to happen at a quicker pace? Yes, but at least we're getting somewhere. At least we're seeing some tangible outcomes. And secondly, in regards to what we're seeing, you know, what I love about this conversation is it's almost two different generations, you know, um, as far as my generation being younger, I'm 23 and we've got an older generation. You know, art is something that connects all human beings. And, you know, looking at the 90s, for example, Tupac Shakur, one of the most prolific, um, revered rappers um, ever to do it, he spoke about these issues of police brutality. Fast forward to modern day, you've got Kendrick Lamar, you've got J. Cole, you've got Jay-Z, you've got Meek Mill, you've got this artistic expression. And I think that's one consequence of what's going on right now. You've got the youth using the art to, to channel and to, to really express what they're feeling in a way that hip hop in the US um, in 2018 became the most popular genre of music, to my knowledge. So people are listening to it. Hip hop has a voice. And you've got some very powerful, conscious individuals at the top of that pyramid, arguably. So there's a narrative there and people can hear it and people can hear what we have to say. So to answer the question, the law and a legal change and also artistic expression are two that we are seeing. So, so uh, anyone else want to respond on that? I mean, it, I, I'd say, okay. like to. Yes, Rihanna. Um, what I would say is there are major issues that are affecting black people and what George Floyd's death or murder has done, has brought a spotlight to some of the issues that we're facing. For instance, colonization still exists in Africa. Not only did they divide the country into, 50, sorry, the continent into 54 different countries, gave each of us different languages so that we couldn't communicate with each other or get back together, but France is still colonizing 14 countries in Africa and takes 500 billion out of Africa every year. And no one's talking about that yet, but it's an issue that we're addressing now. On top of that, when they abolished or agreed to abolish slavery, slavery was illegal unless, or working and without pay was illegal unless that person was a criminal. And once they abolished slavery, all of a sudden you see the number of black people being put in prison skyrocket. 
these things are not mutually exclusive and the entire system needs to be broken down, but we're just starting very small. So what the protests are doing is bringing a spotlight to the very real issues. And what I th don't think people realize is that before they enslaved black people, they enslaved white people. It's just that they couldn't deal with the heat in the Caribbean. So they then ended up getting a race that was indestructible for lack of a better term. So don't think for a moment that if all black people disappeared tomorrow, the people that were rioting in central London wouldn't be in the exact same position working for capitalist means. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Michael, Marjorie, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I wanted to. Just, I just wanted to add that today for the lady in Croydon, that um, they are marching right now in Croydon at Queen's Garden, uh -huh. Croydon, um, and they're doing it with the local community, with the mayor. So um, they'll have Roger Samuels as a singer, the voice of UK, and the politicians, and all of the churches are marching today, right now, in Croydon. And the person's question was, what what changes? Yeah, what is all this uh, rioting? Yeah, the protest riotous behaviour is most of it, and it's changed the world. The world is now focusing on racial injustice and injustice in general, but with a great focus on injustice against black people. So the world is changing. And this person asked, what change is there? There's phenomenal change. The powers that be sit up and listen. My sister-in-law is in a phenomenal youth club that, that is mainly um, black children going to. It's a new concept. It's mainly black workers and all the, Legacy all, the heads, all the heads are white. And she was asking a meeting last week, what change can be there? And she said the change can be that in the senior management roles, we have black faces. We've got them as workers. We've got them as members. We haven't got them in senior management roles. Mm -hmm. And senior management had to turn around and say, in that case, we're promoting people right now to senior management. This is a time for change at top level. And the person asked what, what's, what change there is. The world has heard a cry and there's a change. And as a Christian, I believe it's God's hand turning setbacks and evil things into leaps forward. This is going to be a leap forward for the world. And the world will change to be a better place, a fairer place, a more equ uh, equal place, egalitarian place, a more Christian and loving place because of the marches that have happened. And, and may they continue. I think, you know, out of it, I think out of it, black people are more joining together than ever before. Before they were divided. Now we're all coming closer together. We're communicating together, and you know we're not fighting as you know as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jackie, can we get Jackie in? Jackie, okay. Jennifer Miller also says the conversations are are taking place in the workplace as we speak. So you know things are if things are happening. So Clayton, Clayton, things are happening. You, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but you know what? We've got to keep going on with it. Jackie, are you with me? She's there, but we, we can't get, we, we got to move on. So, okay. Um, you, you know, when we talk about what Clayton is saying and, and, and last week somebody posed the question, they said, look, we've had these race riots, we had it in Tottenham 2011, we had this, you know, for the murder of, of that, uh, you know, uh, 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 our, our black brothers. Um, you know, and then every time we do have a rally, every time we do have a protest, every time we do sort of, you know, have these, these marches, uh, only a trickle effect happens. Um, what what I think they are fed up with, and I'm not to say that they don't think something great could happen here, but from from what I read between the lines with a lot of our viewers that came in and spoke to, to us, um, they, they were sort of saying, oh, here we go again. You know, that sort of attitude. But like you, you know, I know what we're all still saying, we've still got to do it, we've still got to persevere, we've still got to do these protests, but there are a lot of people out there who've seen it all before, you know, race riots back in the 60s you know the 80s and you know then you know in the 20,000s um so i can understand what, what they're saying but um you know we we have to continue we have to continue so where 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 do we go to now that was the first question where do we go to now what level do we want to see the black um uh, lives uh, matters movement go up to do we now go on the negotiating table do we lobby uh, government do we start uh, pointing out legislation and what we want done. I'm going to talk about this in a moment because somebody's saying 
you're not talking about the statues. <laughs> so they wanted to they wanted to say you're, you haven't mentioned this. I did actually mention the statues in my in my intro. But OK, let's talk about statues. So uh, who we got here, Angela, Angela from um, um, Basingstoke. Uh, she's in favour of many of the statues being torn down or with negotiations for them to be put into the um, museums. Agreed? No. Can I just say? Agreed. I was agreed. agreed. Yeah. That's the first conversation I started off with. That the, the, the first statue I'd like to be putting up right now is Sam King at the Windrush Square. If that. you remember when we first started yeah. talking, we said we said that and we said we'd like to, as they tear down all the statues, you know, of, of men who is, is um, coming to, you know, used us as slavery, let's put up black people who has, who has made change to society because there's many out there. There's not just Mary Seacole, there's many others, other great women, you know, has done great things and other great men has done things. And we need to see those statues. Yeah. Rihanna? Can I just say, um, Dr. Umar Johnson put it very well. The issue of the statues is like worrying about the painting on a house. The entire system is rotten to the core. The foundation that the house is built on is rotten. And we're worried about the painting of the houses. Rip, ripping down the statues was an act of frustration and I'm not against them ripping down the statues, do what you do, but I'm not worried about them. I don't look at statues when I go into, that's not something that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I do think it's important for them to erect uh, black statues as much as they would erect white statues. But if people don't even understand who Sam King is and what he really did because they're not educated, they can't even, get the value out of having that statue. So in my opinion, we need to organize ourselves and deal with the actual foundation before we worry about the decoration. Because in my opinion, this is one of their biggest tricks that they pull out their bag. It's a distraction from the real issue. Norman. If I can jump in there. So um, pivoting off what Rihanna had to say, um, this whole concept of the UK is not innocent. When I've spoken to people, there's been a bit of, um, a difficulty in understanding like why has the UK reacted so intensely and, and so emotively with regards to Black Lives Matter and you know there are several factors with regards to real issues that are going on as to why there's this is going this is going on and I think there are five key factors we need to consider so I'm going to list them very quickly so first of all we have the Wim Rush scandal in 2018 which um, saw some some victims losing their jobs and being deported in instances being wrongfully. You have the Grenfell, Tire, um, Grenfell Tower incident in 2017, which led to the death of 72 people, many of them black and Asian, um, allegedly because of neglect, um, calls for increased education about Britain's colonial past, disproportionate deaths in the Bain community due to, um, because of COVID-19, and you know more information surrounding why that is, and also de deaths in police custody and police brutality in the UK um, over time from the 90s to present. So looking at those five factors and really building what Rihanna had to say about sorts of what the real, what the what the what the more rooted issues are at play, I think what where we go from here, especially in the UK, is sort of unpicking some of these bigger issues and really delving into okay, how do we now begin to right the wrongs? How do we begin to sort of work out? And again, this is a thing of I've accepted because I'm only 23, but when I when I read history, things have taken time. I would love things to change tomorrow, but I I don't think that's going to happen. So I, I appreciate things are going to take time. And the, the first part is for all of us to come to a place of what are the key issues that we need to tackle right now. And when we pick apart those five key factors, we can really start to then work on, okay, how can we work to mitigate the effects of deaths in police custody or um, disproportionate deaths in the baby community due to COVID? If that makes sense. I know, I know. There's, there's, there's a whole bit more. I mean, I, I can't even go through them all now. It, we, we've run out of time. Um, <laughs> it's not going away so every yeah. week we're going to be on this so it's not going away so any all of you guys that you know you've you've written in you've, you've got your comments you've got we will get to you so I, I, it's not going to be wasted it's not going to be wasted at all if next week we can put you can put this on but thank you ever so much for your response of course it's huge of course you will be responding in your masses you know so sorry i couldn't get through it all ever so much thanking you thanking you michael and Marjorie King, thanking you, Rihanna Thompson, thanking you, Norman. I'll see you soon, Norman. And I don't know if Dr. Jackie Jeffrey is still there, but thank you, Jackie, if you can hear me. But anyway, thank you ever so much. Take care, all of you, and blessings.
Thanks. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Well, um, I'm going to still say that I, I'm so sorry that we couldn't really go through all the um, questions, the comments and everything um, that, that, that um, our, our viewers are sending to us. But thank you ever so much. Keep them coming, though, because I can still do them uh, for next week. This isn't going away, as I've said. Um, just before we do a little, 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 little bit of a break, is there, is there my co-conspirator with me? Can I have Mr. Oh, hey, I hey, hey, hey. You ain't got that seat, the crown. Where, where was that big... Uh, uh, See that you're sitting on that can call you sir anton don't, don't, don't worry don't worry don't worry but backgrounds don't define titles ah! <laughs> okay don't, don't worry about me I, I, no, i'm a mover and shaker in the world of yeah, um yeah, travel I, I i'm keeping the world there so i'm between places um between weeks so sometimes you'll recognize this background other times i'm more regal but no sir crown it's all there it's all there <laughs> <laughs> and I, I did, Anthony, what we said earlier on the show, we hope people have been listening. I think it might go more to your side of it in, in the entertainment corner. Really listen out here because we've got that gorgeous hamper. Indeed. Think... Indeed we do. Indeed we do. And it's up for grabs. It's up for grabs. It's not for us. It's not for... <laughs> we, can't, we can't win this. Um, yeah, but it, it's there for one one lucky winner. And um, I believe you'll be announced next week. So we'll put the question out there and you'll have a chance to win this. So do keep tuned for a... Uh, a, a little boost of the immune system in, in these current times, a, a boost to lighten your day in these trying times that we've had. Yeah, yeah. This one's for you, for sure. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So you're coming up with, we, we need those vibes going on. We need the, you know, musical feel good factor and entertainment gossip and just to hear some words of inspiration as well. And indeed, indeed. You. Uh, Tessa Webb, uh, we'll, oh, um, we can't stop. Well said, Pam, we can't stop. We've got to keep going on. Basically, we've got to keep protesting. That's what she said. Tessa Webb has said, we've got to keep protesting. We've got to keep doing it. We can't stop now. All right. That's the one. That is the one indeed. Indeed. Okay. So thank you, guys. And guys, again, just keep commenting and we will interact as much as we can. It is busy, but if you're there, we will acknowledge you as much as we can. So, yeah, we'll off for a break and we'll talk to you. So, Anthony. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, Pam, I will take over, push you aside if you don't mind. <laughs> it's now time for the entertainment corner. Okay, guys, um, we are going to try and lighten the mood, but still maintain the message that is there. It will be a, a powerful one. So right now, I'm actually going to be honoured. Pam mentioned this gentleman earlier. Um, I'm going to be honoured to introduce the, the winner of Poet of the Year 2019 um, by the um uk entertainment industry um he also puts on a poetry show the the poetry jam and he's a excellent excellent spoken word artist who we had at the tamara soiree can i welcome please mr terrell lewis how you doing sir <laughs> <laughs> how, how are things nice to see you again oh thank you guys for having me on the show man much appreciated uh, things are we obviously we are in unprecedented times at this precise moment but you Indeed. know all we would just be as productive as possible and you know um whatever way we can affect change as individuals i would definitely encourage everybody to you know um play their part in, ma in making those those positive changes yeah for sure for sure so i mean talking of that um just in the previous segment which i believe you were listening to we were talking about the artistic form um we will go back in your career but considering like the the madness that we're in at the moment the artistic form, someone as yourself, how do you believe the message can be passed through from poets as yourself and other people in the artistic industry? Um, well, just in regards to myself in, um, as a spoken word artist, the, the message can be, it's, it's a lot more, not that rap and other, other genres of music are not receptive, but in my personal opinion, I would say spoken word and poetry is a little bit more receptive in comparison to the other genres of music. Um, myself personally, you know, the 
the the impact of the the messages that I have put out there in a short space of time that I have been on the receiving has been absolutely phenomenal. So you know when I am when I am writing a lot of the work that I do produce and put out there is my, my it's, it's it's to empower. It's all about sure. empowerment. And even currently, as we stand at this precise moment, I am working on a collaborative piece with a few other um with a few other poets because basically at the moment all I all all I'm seeing is on, on social media is there's a lot of anger from the people. There's a lot of upset. There's a lot of, there's a lot of hate and which, which I can obviously, I can obviously appreciate that, but this, we need to kind of see a little bit of positive imagery and, and some positive representation. So I'm just going to inject just a little bit of love with this next visual that I'm, that I'm currently working on with um, a selective few of poets. As well. No, Brilliant. That is that is fantastic. And I believe again, it's it's been noted, so it's not my belief, it's actually out there that these are trying times, whether it be COVID, whether it be the the whole Black Lives Matter, that yeah. in this current situation, people are mentally being challenged. And sources such as yourself and the other poets coming together to to brill provide that form of entertainment and a break from this new normal or this unnormal situation that we're in really helps to encourage people in a way and give them hope. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And as I said, it's nobody's. We, we were so unprepared for this, even myself, you know. And definitely, what I've learned being in um, being in this situation is mental stimulation, productivity. Give use use obviously using this time to reevaluate things that I would consider at a time to be priority, and really evaluate what are the essential things that I need to do. And that, that's what I definitely encourage everybody else. Um, to, to do um, to be doing as well. So for me personally, as a creative, um, and I've obviously had the benefit of going on furlough as well. So that I've, so I've had more time to obviously dedicate dedicate to my craft as well. So um, with, with that being said, I've been using this time to just really write, home in on, you know, what I want after this because the facts of the matter are, this is not forever. And as you can see, we are coming out of it. The government are easing. Um, you know, the, the restrictions of, of COVID, etc. So the question that we, we should ask ourselves are, where were we when we started and where do we want to be when this, when, when this is over? Because this is definitely going to be over. So um, that's how I looked at it. I looked at, looked at it as an opportunity to execute certain plans and ideas because we are always saying that we don't have enough time. Well, with the powers that be, they're like, all right, cool. You look for all this time now. Let's see what you want to do with it. But then, as you know, human nature, we're still complaining now. Like we've, we've got too much time. We don't know what to do with it. So we just don't know how to win. You know. So just just try to be as productive as you can. Put down your phones. I had to come off social media. I took a you know I took I took a week off, and that week that I took off social media allowed me to just recharge my batteries because it's mentally draining as well. There's so many. There's so much information as conspiracy theorists everybody has an opinion about you know covid and all of this kind of stuff and it is it is taxing on the on the human brain so because obviously you know there's all this information you know people come to various different conclusions and it could either you know have a positive or a negative effect on on people's perceptions so, yeah. Do you know what per worded perfectly, and I totally agree with you. Um, I do understand, and I, you know, I don't knock anyone who hasn't been able to create anything in this time. But like yourself, I you saw an opportunity that there were so many things that you said we don't have time to do, and what, while it's still there, and I'm just as my touch to anyone. Remember, if you are on furlough, you're still getting paid on this time, so like make the absolute most of it. And again, I appreciate that it's not that capable for everyone. You don't have to find a goal, just. If you are looking for that time, this is a, <laughs> that small last nudge from the two of us um, exactly. on that one. So no, no, really appreciate that and agree with that. So we're talking of that. Um, let's talk about Terrell himself. How, where did the passion and inspiration come from to enter the world of spoken word? Oh God, you know what? It's um, <laughs> it's it's just one of those things where it just happened. Um, but my mum's a writer. So yeah, so my, my, my mom's a writer, but I wasn't really interested in writing. So what happened was, um, so obviously originally I'm from London, but I left London in 2015. I left London in 2015 and I moved down to the South Coast. Um, 
in Portsmouth area. Okay. Going from London to Portsmouth was a very difficult transition for myself in terms of I left my entire social network, my my friends, family, and um, was creating a new life down at the south of England. And that transition really took its toll on me mentally. So obviously not having, you know, the, 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 the close contact with friends or family members, obviously I could call them on the phone, but it was just a little bit different. So my only outlet at the time was writing. And my the, the opportunity came to me. I was um, at, I was in attendance at a party and I met a gentleman by the name of Max Nelson, who is, um, he was a police officer in the local constabulary in the area. And he's a, an acoustic guitar player. So me and him got, me and him got talking and um, he invited me to an open mic night. So we went to this open mic night in a place called Chichester, West Sussex, which is near the area of Bognor Regis. It's a very predominantly white area, if you haven't heard of it before. So we went to this uh, we went to this club. I was the only black person in the building. And he went on stage first, and then he introduced myself to come onto the stage. And the piece that I um, was going to perform, there, it, there was, um, you know, making some references to, you know, uh, myself growing up as a black man, etc. Now, for me to perform that piece in front of an all-white crowd, I definitely got uncomfortable because I didn't know if they were going to relate to some of the things that I was going to say, and it just really made me feel uneasy. And then the kind of the final nail in the coffin, just before I was about to perform, four elderly white ladies came in and sat at the back, and I was just like, no, nah, I don't want to do this. But I composed myself, I delivered my message, and as soon as I finished place erupted i got a standing ovation clapping roars cheers everything and then as i was exiting the building one of the ladies of that group stopped me and asked me if i was a published author and i said no that was my first yeah. time going on stage so she said her exact words were you have a gift don't stop keep going so from that moment there i was like all right let me let me roll with this for a little bit more so i started to do more open mic nights affect my stage presence more writing, write more material, and you know, like a year and a bit later, here I am. <laughs> no, fantastic, fantastic. And you've been doing such great works with that that you've even started your own poetry shows actually in yeah. the UK. How, how has that been going for yourself? Yeah, so that's good. So, um, myself and a good friend of mine, Kojo Anim, Kojo the comedian, he's yes, the, yes, yeah, yeah, so he's the producer of the show. Um, so me and him created the Poetry Jam because he's a massive fan of poetry as well. And that platform is obviously just, what we wanted to do is we want to give people a positive experience into poetry because a lot of people still don't really understand poetry and spoken word. Even, you know, even myself, before I came into the game, I had my own perception of what it actually is. So the show that we created, it's a, it's, it's, um, it's a blend of poetry, Shakespeare, hip hop rap it's, it's nice it's, it's, all, it's all of those merged into into one and the, the selective the selected artists that i have or bring on board deliver it including myself in such a way that is so captivating so engaging that it appeals and engages all listeners of all ages so if you haven't been to my show or if you have been to my show and you look in the crowd the age ranges anywhere from from 18 up until late late sixties. Fantastic. Because the story because the stories are so versatile and so eclectic, there's something there that will resonate with each person in that room. And that's the and, and that's what you know the show is about. It's giving people an experience into spoken word um, and poetry. Because I do feel that there is a misunderstanding between poetry and the rest of the other um, you know like genres of, 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 of music. Because the facts of the matter is, rap stands for rhythm and poetry. You can't have one without the other. Indeed, I no, agree. Exactly, but a lot of people just have, you know, their, their association to, to, to poetry as not being cool or not for them, which is absolutely fine. But, you know, come to the show and then make your opinion thereafter. And I'm proud to say that my conversion ratio is very, very high for non-believers. And I suppose that's where the award came last last year. You poet, yes. poet of the year. Yeah, so the yeah, so the award um 
So what happened was I I didn't even know I was being nominated. So with that, I was at my house and my phone just kept going off. I was getting all of these notifications through. Um, so I picked up my phone and I looked on Instagram and I saw that I got tagged in a post and it was obviously UK Entertainment, Terrell Lewis, Best Poet nominee. And for my, so my background, I'm a sports person. So I'm really competitive. I'm a footballer. And before, um, once I saw that I was nominated, I knew I was going to win. That was it. That was the only thing that I had. No, seriously. I like, was, I like the mentality. That was the only thing that I had in my mind that I was going to win. I didn't care about my competition. I didn't look at the competition or who I was up against until after I won the award, until on the night of, of, the, of the ceremony. I didn't care. So once, once um, it became, once I, I got made aware that I was being nominated, I ramped it up even more, I put out more videos, I'd done more shows. I paid for marketing to, you know, just help um, reach a lot more people with 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 um, with, the work, with the work that I was doing, and I just put in so much work to win that award and to be able to win the award. So I won the award um, in November. This was ten months into my spoken word journey or career. So I oh haven't I hadn't been doing this a year yet. So this was ten months into it. Um, you know, you can watch the, the full video on, on my Instagram. You can see, you know, um, when I when they're reading out the nominees and my reaction to me winning, I, I went with my parents. My mum and dad accompanied me on the night. And just to achieve what I achieved within a 10-month time frame, not, you know, coming into this, um, you know, this game with no experience, nothing, and just being, just, just having just raw talent and just having a message to deliver to you guys, was an absolutely amazing and overwhelming experience. And it's just something that I'm just so thankful and appreciative of. So, you know, with that being said, you know, I'm in a position where I'm using my voice and my words and my mess my messages to empower and to encourage, you know, everybody, all people, especially, you know what I mean, my own people, because I feel that we just need it the most, that like we need a voice. So Perfect. however I yeah, exactly. So however I can affect that, you know, that that positive change. I'm going to do that. And you know what? That is a perfect segue. One, you mentioned Instagram. And two, you mentioned empowering our people. With the echoes that you've done and the empowerment you have, um, can, if possible, can we also bring Jade into this, into this chat, please? Um, this is a young lady who's been featuring the comedy section with us. And she's got a powerful video, which we're going to show. But you actually commented on her video recently. So I don't know if you recognise the not face, that. but I thought I could do a, not, not, a quick intro. Yeah. I Wait, did I comment? Um, yeah, you, but the one I'm was you in the car was you in the car? Yeah, yeah. But the video yes. I'm showing now is um, it's a monologue from my play that I did in Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So okay. it's about protesting and not exactly to do with Black Lives Matter, but we tried to like intertwine it. Um, okay. But yeah, it's about basically using your voice and not being silent because that's not perfect. We need everyone to use their voice and stuff. Okay, so let's have a look at that video, and then after that, Terrell, we'll get you to put out your contacts and yeah, yeah. hopefully if we can, a, a quick one from you to close the show. But yeah, let's have a look at your video, Jade. Speak up. <laughs> If you want to fight it, then fight. But staying silent, that's the worst possible action. Because that means no action at all. It's weak. Do you understand how lucky you are? You have a voice. You have freedom. Freedom to raise your voice. There's a whole other world out there with hundreds and thousands of girls with nowhere to go. And it's not that their wings are clipped. They didn't even grow wings to begin with. They're born with shame. Shame around their bodies. Shame about expressing themselves. But you, where does your shame come from? Why are you so ashamed to speak up? Don't you see that you're only serving the shame that they have around here? They don't matter. You matter. Silence doesn't matter. Having a voice matters. You've been blessed, born with the opportunity 
to give your voice a real meaning. You're just trying to boil the ocean. When you could move mountains if you tried. Fantastic. Well done, Jade. Honestly, once again, I just have to put Thank like you. massive props out to you guys. Um, both of you, like, congratulate. Like, Jade, I announced your award like two weeks ago. Terrell, I'm announcing yours. I'm no one in this game because I've got like, no awards. But okay, no, big up to both of you. Fantastic. Um, time is really pressing. Um, Jade, just like, if you can, in like a minute, give us how that all came about. And then, Terrell, if we can get your contact info, and I'll be saying my goodbyes from there. Yeah. Um, so it's written by Natalie and Boyd, who wrote the whole play. I was the character in the play. I was two characters actually, and um, in that in that bit in particular, I was saying to a girl, you know, if you want to protest, use your voice. You know, being silent doesn't help any of the issues. As I was someone who went through, um, basically, it was ge genital um, mutilation that my character suffered with. So okay. Basically use your voice you know not don't be silent about these issues and yeah so she oh we lost you there Jay. yeah okay oh we got a bit of a rough connection terrell sorry can we just also get your contact details for anyone wanting to know how to get onto you any instas facebook twitters yeah that's fine so my facebook will be terrell the poet so that's t-e-r-r-e-l-l the poet instagram is ty t-y underscore Terrell, T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Um, those are the two main pages that I've got and all my other details are held in the bio of those pages. Perfect, guys. Thank you very much, Jade. Definitely next week, Terrell, we will be in contact again and congratulations to you both on your awards. Um, yeah, time is running. Pam, I'm going to call you back <laughs> if possible. Sorry, guys, it's been a bit of a rush one, but it's been such a powerful, powerful approach. Just love everything that you guys have done. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Harold Lewis, oh, a wonderful, wonderful guy, and and to, he did get a standing, standing uh, uh, ovation, didn't he? At the, uh, he did, he did indeed. Uh, soiree in, in 2019, and he's just spoken about you know all all the time he's getting it like that. It's oh, absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We've got to and Jade Marie, well of course Jade Marie, um, absolutely brilliant. We've got to give a question out. Come on, Anthony, quick. Where, what town did Terrell perform that first um, poetry? Where was it? What was the name of the town? You should have paid attention. He mentioned it. Yeah, there you go. That's as much as we can do. At Lifestyle on Ben um, on Facebook and Lifestyle TV show. Lifestyle on Ben at hotmail.com. Um, .com. Yeah, .co .uk even better. Yeah. yeah. So be sure to enter. And that hamper is all yours. The hamper is all yours. And it's a wonderful hamper. Dalgetty teas. Wonderful. Lots of lovely herbal herbal infusions and, and what have you is, is absolutely brilliant. Anthony, the time just flies back so, so quickly. So um, nothing more to say except for watch us on the Ben um, TV Sky Channel platform. Yep, 458. And thank you very much to me, Jeanette Live, for providing it to you guys on your Facebook and YouTube on a Sunday Bye. evening. Tamara, event designers, Indeed. Lost Incorporated, and uh, Getty Tees. That's and the one. I want to say stay safe, stay strong, and stay blessed. That's the one. Until next week, folks, I'm out. See ya. We're out. Bye.